Hey there, folks, you're all here. I have with me uh, Sean Merwin, who is the lead designer on Surviving Strange Hollow, a new 5e supplement that is currently in Kickstarter and will be coming to your, your front door here soon. Uh, Sean, could you introduce yourself uh, and also just uh, say a few words about Strange Hollow? Well, as you said, I'm Sean Merwin. I've been a role-playing game designer, either freelance or full-time, since 2001. And so I've been through 3rd edition, 4th edition, 5th edition D&D, as well as several other games. Surviving Strange Hollow is a project that's being done by Accidental Cyclops Publishing. Uh, they did a game that people may have heard of called The Real Thing a few years ago, which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game based on the music of Faith No More. Uh, and that caught my attention. I didn't buy it, but I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never never imagined doing such a thing. That would have been cool. And then later, uh, when XL Cyclops decided to do this project, uh, they reached out to me and said, would you be interested? Because I had communicated with them on other topics. And I said, tell me about it. And after they pitched it to me, I was really excited. So I signed up for the madness that is uh, designing a supplement for a role-playing game. Awesome. So uh, as far as designing the mm -hmm. uh, supplement is concerned, this seems like, uh, you know, I, I'm going to pull up the, the, the cast here. There are a mm -hmm. lot of writers on this project. The, the art is done by Emily Hare. For me, it's difficult to describe the, the art style, but it, it is a really important, prominent, powerful part of yeah. uh, Surviving Strange Hollow. When it comes to the the writing, you know, Sean Merwin, of course, uh, Ed uh, Greenwood, Alyssa Teague, James Haig, Dan Dillon, Aaron Roberts, Brian C.P. Steele, and uh, Dale Kingsmill. Mm -hmm. All That's lots of different writers, uh, all of okay. which have a diverse background in, yeah. uh, in works like this. So how is, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at a product like this, I guess, how does this all come together? How do you keep so many, um, so many writers kind of like pulling toward the same objective? Uh, a lot of communication, a lot of time and a lot of whiskey is generally my, my modus operandi. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a process, right? You, you set up a process and then you follow the process as best you can. So in, in, in this case, what drew me to the project was starting with Emily's art, kind of like starting with the music of a band. And then let's build a game based on that. This was Emily's art. Now she's not a role-playing game designer. She's not a role-playing game enthusiast, uh, but she is a fantasy enthusiast and a very talented artist, obviously, with a vision. And her vision is very visual. And so when uh, Mikey and Jason from Accidental Cyclops went to her and said, could we partner with you, use your art, we build a role-playing game supplement based on that, uh, it was very unique. It's not often that you start with art. And so when they brought me in, the process I decided to use was rather than going make the rules and maybe build the world at the same time and then figure out stories to put in that world and then make the art, let's just do that in complete reverse. Let's start with the art, which is generally the last thing that's brought into a project. Then let's find some people who are very talented storytellers, uh, not even necessarily experienced game designers, although a lot of them are, but these are people I've been in contact with or been familiar with their work in the past. And I wanted to see what they would come up with in terms of just telling a story. Because when we play role-playing games, obviously we're getting into the rules and we use the rules, but hopefully the product of play is a story. It's a narrative that we're telling with a game master and players. So I thought, all right, let's see what these folks can do coming up with just a story based on this art and a few prompts based on Emily's vision for this. And that's where we started. And I got outlines from each of these writers based on just the art and those prompts saying, tell me a really cool story. And everyone came back with something just slightly different. Um, it's all fantasy. It's all right. It's all set in that realm that we're used to. But, you know, one person set it up as a tall tale. One person set, set it up as sort of a Gawain in the Green Knight 
type quest. Someone set it up as a recipe book that was passed down from generation to generation of people that lived on the fringes of this land. And you know, the connections were made not through a narrative then, but through this recipe book and the notes that were written in it. And I got all different sorts of things, but there were themes in each of these stories. There were themes of transformation, whether physical transformation or sort of a societal uh, psychic transformation as you go. And so I thought, okay, well, when we make these rules, obviously this world needs transformation, not just of players earning experience points and getting stronger, but of the characters actually changing as they go through. So we're going to need rules about that mm. and ways for players to decide that they, how they want that to work for their character. And, you know, I just kept going back and seeing what sort of themes despite the differences in the writers and their, their actual story, what themes were coming through. And now, okay, we're going to make rules based on that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. The, uh, that transportation or transportation, the, uh, transformation seems to be a, a big part of, uh, strange hollow in general. just, you know, those who, who go in, you know, of those that leave, they won't leave unchanged. Right. Uh, that's, that's really interesting to me. You know, when I, I saw the, Strange Hollow. It reminded me a lot of uh, books that I was maybe read or just knew about when I was a kid because of the the art. And in looking mm -hmm. at that, I was like, oh, okay, I don't know if this product is, is for me because, you know, it might be geared toward, you know, younger audience and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But then when I started going through the actual art and seeing things that are just like a little bit twisted and it's like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, I did not expect that. That is, yeah. it was compelling so i i have uh funded the you know funded the project i'm gonna get a yeah. book uh when when you're all are done i'm interested in, in playing it not just uh because it is a very interesting approach you know art first like you mentioned mm -hmm. and then uh, designing the the supplement to follow and but i also think that my kid would like it you know, you had mentioned the uh all these sorts of different types of stories being told but when it comes to uh, all those different types of stories. How do you feel that that kind of came together into a product that, that feels cohesive? Well, it, it, that's where the rules come in, right? That's where we need to create a system by which players, no matter where they're starting from, can come into the, the machine of the rules and have it lead them through a type of story that maybe they're not accustomed to telling with role-playing games um, because in role-playing games if if you take a typical dungeons and dragons game and you ask your the players how did your character change throughout this story many of them are just going to say well i gained levels um i lost hit points uh, i was cursed once but that went away when the cleric cast removed curse on me 10 minutes later i died and, and then i revived again <laughs> right. And, and so that that change, that change isn't necessarily um, promulgated by the rules of fifth edition D&D. &D. So what we want to do is take that and put it front and center for the players, not just as a reactive thing of, OK, you got cursed. Now you have to deal with all of this, but as an active thing of. What does your character want? Why is your character going into this land? What are your relationship to the people that you're going into this land with? For I'm going to use an example that we might not end up keeping, but something that's been on my mind is you're going to run a campaign where all the characters are doomed. The doom is part of the fun of the game. Even if they complete goals, at the end of this, they're not going to make it. And we're going to have mechanics that both um, make that playable, but interesting and fun, as opposed to just this bad thing. You know, you have exhaustion and it's just bad. And your goal is to get rid of exhaustion. Uh, we don't want that, right? We want there to be mechanics that prop up play because of that doom, rather than force the play to seem gloomy despite that, right? We want it to be something fun for the player, even if it's not fun for the character. And, and so if we introduce ways to do that, 
even if we can get that one thing right, uh, I think it's a success because it will teach DMs a new way to present stories and the players a new mindset of how they might be able to enhance the stories that they're playing. Right. I, I totally feel that. I, oftentimes, yeah. when you're looking at 5th edition Duns and Dungeons and Dragons, you're almost inventing ways to slow down the players or mm -hmm. make them feel some sort of impact. But when it comes to uh, just, just playing the game in general, I, I think campaign structure is, is really important because you can create mm -hmm. limitations and li limitations foster creativity. So mm -hmm. going, I, I love to hear that. It makes me even more interested in the, in the, yeah. the product now. Speaking of um, just all these kind of differences between uh, what you'd find in 5th edition, what type of player do you think would uh, be interested in a, a product like this? Well, we're obviously looking for hopefully a wide range of, of folks because as you know, and as anybody who's played for more than you know, a few years or with a variety of players know that the audience is huge and broad with a bunch of different wants, desires, and needs for the game. So the first thing we want is we want players to know you will get all the options that you would normally get in a supplement. There will be a new, at least one new class, at least one new species, backgrounds, feats, subclasses, all of those things that meld nicely into the, the tone of, of this. You know, one of survival, one of exploration, one of weird uh, things happening. And not in a dark fantasy way, right? Not in a grim, dark horror constantly, but in sort of a, a giddy, <laughs> you know, sort of way. Uh, Emily, uh, the artist, sort of, she wants this labyrinth sort of feel, but also a Monty Python feel, right? It's like the killer rabbit, but, but a little less funny. Right? It's, oh, look at this cute little thing we see, and all of a sudden it's just decapitated you know, the, your, your ally next to you. <laughs> right. Uh, right. So the, the, there's a little bit of whimsy to it, but whimsy in a way that's sort of dark humor as, as you go. And, and so we'll have to provide ways for people who have never played that sort of game to lean into that. Um, with, with a friend of mine, Teo Sabadilla, I made the Acquisitions Incorporated hardcover book for Wizards. And that's all about right humor, but it, humor in a, in a very gallows humor sort of way. The the late stage capitalism bent of an adventuring party, and so you sort of have to teach people to to do that as you go. So that'll be one of the challenges of teaching new players. You know, yeah, here's your subclasses, here's feats, and here's new spells, and here's all of that. But here's a different way to play. Let us, let us show you. And then, of course, for the game master, we'll teach the game masters how to tell stories of both wonder and dark humor, tell stories that challenge the players to see their character, characters narratively instead of just mechanically. Uh, and then if you love cool art and new monsters, those will be there too. The new monsters will not just claw and bite you, they will bring some of this uh, change. They will bring some of this transformation uh, and some whimsy, but also some some you know darkness to to the project. Okay, here's a here's a really nuts and bolts question. I don't know if mm -hmm. if we'll keep this in the recording or not, but a personal interest. Okay. What sort of diversity of content do you feel is necessary to have in a Kickstarter campaign, in a a new supplement, kind of in general, like subclasses, species, new spells, new you know backgrounds, that sort of thing. How much of yeah. it is, is this is what we need to sell it? Mm -hmm. uh, and how much of it is uh, this, this is what we, we wish we could focus on more? Yeah, I think, I think the answer is you do need a little bit of everything. In, if you're trying to get across a, a theme that's not normally served by the game, you do need these new things. Uh, even if it's just one new class, or one new uh, uh, species to show the game master. If you expand on this yourself, because you game master are a game designer and you may want to take this and run with it. See what we did. You could also do this in these different directions. So I think it's important to have that. Uh, 
you know, in terms of needing something to sell something, in my experience recently, the the draw of something, you can have 27 incredible designers all putting their best work into something. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to catch the wider imagination of folks um, as opposed to having a stream that has half a million uh, viewers and then you put something out and it's, you know, it explodes. And it doesn't have anything to do with the design necessarily because you haven't seen the design yet. It has to do with the popularity of the, of the people. And it's just the way life is. And, and that's okay, right? We, we still, we're, we're game designers. We're going to design games, whether it sells, you know, a million dollars on Kickstarter or if it does, you know, 10,000 on Kickstarter. We're, we're going to do what we do. Uh, so I want the new stuff to serve the goal of the project, uh, which is what I've been talking about. Now, uh, Jason and Mikey of, from Accidental Cyclops may have their own thing that they want to put in. And our writing team, uh, which you've mentioned, and then Dan Dillon, who's going to come in and do rules uh, development with me, may have different thoughts on that. But at least from this angle, I just I want to serve the project as the goal of the project as best we can. Awesome. I dig it. So in the, uh, in the design of, of strange hollow, what was, you know, what is the most challenging or maybe like an unexpected challenge that you encountered while trying to develop? The, the biggest challenge we're facing right now is five E is going to be five E for another six months. And then it's going to be 5.5, uh, 2024 or whatever we're going to call it. And so we, we are specifically not, you know, we're putting together some Ikea furniture, but we're not screwing in every screw all the way because we're going to wait until those 2024 rules come out before we finish doing everything. Cause we don't know what they're going to look like and we that's want nice. it to be compatible with that. Um, so that's been a challenge right there is getting things. We're getting things set up right now before we see that and then go in with the final tweaks. The biggest challenge is, and I think this is true of any, even a new game, is um, what does your audience want and how do you best deliver that? And if you're going to take them, if you're going to take things away from them that they're already familiar with, uh, how do you best do that without being too jarring? Remove curses is an, the, that example, right? It's or Goodberry or these spells that make curses or that make survival games or that make exploration games uh, moot by third level or fifth level. Um, so finding ways to sort of take that expectation that players might have and tweak it a little bit so that they still enjoy the game even though they're going to be playing a slightly different game than they might be used to. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a communication uh, issue, but it's also a game design issue because you want to leave as much intact as you can for those players while still making sure that the theme and the style of play you're trying to deliver is deliverable within uh, the rule set that you're using. Yeah, I can totally sympathize with that. You know, and expectations are yeah, D and D. Yeah. The community is broad. People who play this mm -hmm. game play it in innumerable ways, and uh, catering to to that, I imagine, is uh, insane. But you, I mean, we also learn things from other games, right? We learn things from Fate, where you build your aspects not just to put yourself in the world, but to put yourself together with other players. We learn things from Powered by the Apocalypse games where you you will fail a lot, but it means cool things rather than bad things. Where in, in D&D, failure means static things. <laughs> the state doesn't change. Um, so can we, can we learn from these other games and find ways to bring in elements of those games that maybe a storytelling audience appreciates more than the did you beat the DC? No. Oh, well. All right. 
you you definitely know who you're trying to target uh, mm-hmm. with this particular uh, product. And I feel like it, I, I, I'm wondering if you had, had to find this audience or if some of the pre-existing work from Emily uh, kind of uh, created a strong hook for for the people who yeah. were like, ah, oh, yeah, no, I, I, I want that. Yeah, well, a- Emily s- told us right away that she she had done Kickstarters for her art books and she would get messages from people who supported her saying, we play D&D. Could, do you have stats for these monsters? And Emily's like, well, sorry, I don't play D&D. So there is some crossover right there with the the art that she does. Uh, when when Axel Cyclops came to me and said, we, we want you to work on this project, uh, here's the art that, that Emily does. They opened a book for me and I was like, I've seen that. I'm not a, a visually oriented person. I don't really remember visual things too well. But I was like, I know that. I've seen that somewhere. And you know, it's it's been on a shirt or been on a mug somewhere that I've seen. I'm like, yeah. I, so if I can remember it, you know that it is striking in some way. Uh, so that that's one of the, the things that drew me to it was like, oh, I remember that. I remember that art. Awesome. I love that. So if we were to zoom out a little bit mm-hmm. as far as... You know, you have this all-star cast of of writers. How does somebody who is just starting to write, or you know, somebody who wants to uh, be more involved in the TTRPG space, and maybe they have a talent for uh, putting words on paper, how do they? Uh, how do we get to that point? That's a, it's a great question, and it's one that is impossible to answer on a certain level because everyone who becomes right as a standard creator in the industry has gotten there in a different way. Uh, Chris Perkins got there by submitting endlessly to Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine, which no longer exists. I got there by volunteering for what was the organized play program of third edition of the Role Playing Game Association and Living Greyhawk. That no longer exists. Uh, Some people get there by, by blogging. Right, they wrote blogs, insightful, fun, uh, memorable blogs. That's still there, but less. Some people now get there through putting out content, uh, YouTube, Twitch, etc., uh, TikTok. That is there now, but it's already going out. So, what's the next way? I don't know. But what you can do is you can sort of start writing for role playing games the same way that medical professionals learn their craft. There's an old saying, it's watch one, do one, teach one. So you have to give a tracheotomy, right? They say, okay, watch me do this. Boom. Right. Now you do it. Boom. Okay. Now you can teach somebody else how to do it. And it's that quick. Uh, but that's how, what you need to do. So in, in terms of role-playing games, right, watch one is play the games that you like. Do one is run the games that you like and then teach one is start making things for the games you like and you should be repeating that process over and over and over again you should never think okay i've done it because there's always something else there's always the next thing there's always well i'm a pretty good writer but now everything's moving to tabletop uh digital tabletops all right now i need to learn how to write for that Oh, now it's going to be VR. Okay, now I need to learn how to write something for that. And in order to write for that, you need to do that. And then you need to experiment with that, and then you're ready to move on to the next step. Uh, I teach a class called Writing for Role-Playing Games, where we learn how to write for role-playing games, and we start with interactive fiction, right? They choose your own adventure books or and uh, Twine. Twine, okay. Twine. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we do that. You, you read some interactive fiction, you play it, and then you write it. All right, then we're going to move on to world building. All right, we look at worlds, and then we start world building using microscope. And now we're going to get to uh, simple one-page role-playing games. Uh, Alone Among the Stars is a solo journaling role-playing game where you roll dice, and then it gives you prompts. Right, now we're going to make one. Okay, now we're moving on to Fiasco. And we're going to play Fiasco. All right, now you're going to write a, a, a set, a play set for Fiasco. And it's that's the whole class all the way through. We, we play it or run it 
and then we write it. Awesome. And yeah, that's, that's how you do it. And you never stop. Okay. So for somebody who uh, is maybe more, more established and just drawing on your years of experience, is there, is there something that they could practice today besides what you just mentioned mm-hmm. that would hone their, uh, their writing or just their capabilities as a, a writer, maybe something small that they didn't notice before. Is there anything that you have? I don't know if this fits, but the vet best advice I can give for people in the field um, is often they have not done enough public displays of their work or public interaction with their work. Uh, so, so when I began, freelancing, it was through the RPGA, Role Playing Game Association, and living campaigns or organized play campaigns. I've probably DM'd for 20 to 30,000 people. That's been the key to my success, no doubt, is because I've run my own work, but I've also run work from a, hundreds of other people. So I'll sit down and I have to run this adventure in four hours and I have to sort of stay in the script. So here we go. And then I start running this and I see what the players are reacting to well or what they're tuning out. Okay, now when I write my thing, I'm going to make sure I don't do this and I definitely do this. So what you, the best thing you could do, say, you, say you're making a new game or a new adventure for a, a current game, go to a convention, go to a game uh, store, go to someone where, somewhere where strangers are playing in public. Ask a friend or even a stranger, would you please run this game or this adventure for this group of strangers? And I'm going to watch. But don't tell them that I'm the, I'm the creator. Or I'm going to play, but don't tell anybody I'm the creator. And sit there and keep your mouth shut and open your eyes and open your ears and just watch. Watch that's, what happens. That's, that would be the hardest part for me. It's just like, I can and, help and, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but right. And, and that's, that's the thing is you can help, but you should have helped on the page, not, not doing that. So you sit back and you don't say, you know, asking at the end, did everybody have fun? You know, is, is great. It's good. You can get some good feedback. What's better feedback is watching how actual play works. Uh, how does a real game master and real players, uh, how do they interact with your work? Were there confusion points? What were those confusion points? And how were they resolved without people understanding? Did they just come up with something? And if they did, that might be the design you need to put in because that was sort of the the most ease the, the easiest path to fix that problem. Well, if it's the easiest path to fix the problem, that might be the best fix to the problem. Were there lags in play, uh, both because of the rules or just because of the flow of your game? Did you look around the table and this person's asleep over here because they haven't had a turn, you know, in in twenty minutes? Well. There's something you might need to fix. What were the greatest moments of joy in the game? When were people laughing and, and you know, keen to see a result or, you know, really telling a story between themselves? That's you, something you're going to want to keep or lean into or spread more throughout your rules. So that sort of feedback is the most valuable feedback you can get uh, okay. just by observing. So speaking of joy, uh, why do you write for TTRPGs? From as early as I can remember, I loved stories and I loved games. And there's no greater conjunction of those two things than a tabletop role-playing game. Uh, I was I grew up in a community, very rural, very conservative, where games and stories aren't necessarily uh, seen as conducive to a good life and may even be frowned upon, uh, you know, frivolous. You should be at the factory. You, you, know, you should be doing these things. So as I was introduced to role-playing games and I saw how they were changing the lives of, of me and those around me, I saw firsthand the power of 
role playing games as both a storytelling vehicle and as a game and as a way to bring people together. And so as it changed my life, all I really wanted to do was help spread this so other people's lives could be enhanced by these things as well. So it's it's what I want wanted to do. And I never thought I would get the chance to do this for a living because there was no open gaming license, you know, back in the 80s or 90s. Uh, but then through the power of open gaming licenses and DMs Guild and, and uh, other and third party uh, work and third party games coming to the fore, uh, there the chance came to me and I jumped on it and I wouldn't want to do anything else. I, I would not do well in a nine to five office uh, setting. I've been working remotely even during uh, when I was a project manager and a technical writer for a software company, I still work from home. So I haven't worked in an office setting pretty much ever. I've been a teacher, but uh, that that's it. So I, uh, I just, my life is, is this now and I, Really couldn't be happier. Well, Sean Merwin, on that lovely note, I'd yes. like to say thank you. And Absolutely. You know, for, for all of your uh, hard work and in uh, the work that you're no doubt uh, bound to create and offer to this wonderful uh, TTRPG community. Mm -hmm. So Surviving Strange Hollow, currently in Kickstarter, already funded. Uh, we're looking forward to, to that release. When is the... When is the launch day? Uh, it launched oh, I'm sorry, a week the, uh, ago to the completion yeah. day. I think it's the the I don't know the exact day. It's at the very end of April, so probably like April fifth or sixth around there. Okay. Uh, and you can get to it quickly by going to get dot accidental cyclops dot com or just go to Kickstarter and search Surviving Strange Hollow. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on.